Greetings and welcome once again to CS441-541 Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and well in these difficult times. Today, I want to start a serious discussion of methods for state space search, combinatorial search. Notice that when we use the word search in this class, we're going to mean something different than what Google does. This is not about pattern matching, but it's about looking ahead, like we've talked about recently, to try to find a solution by sort of looking through a state space for the a desired state. So let's uh, see what we can do about starting to explore some of those ideas. And I want to keep playing with sliding tile puzzles like we've been playing with because I think they're a really interesting platform for exploring state space search. They are easy to think about and easy to work with. And you'll recall that recently we poked at what if you just randomly shuffle tiles around. Remember our sliding tile puzzles with the uh, tiles that you can slide around to do things. And we found that sliding around randomly didn't scale very well. That we could solve a three by three puzzle like this in a reasonable number of seconds by sliding around randomly, especially if we tried to avoid places we'd already been. But we also know we can do a lot better. We'd like to be able to solve four by four puzzles and stuff. And so what we're gonna do is sort of a series of escalating ideas designed to make it obvious how we do that sort of thing. So let's start with uh, breadth first search. And breadth first search I think might be sort of we may have been avoiding the obvious because this looks like a really interesting way to solve sliding tile puzzles, right? We uh, imagine we start here in our state space and what we'd really like to do then is check and we're thinking this is an undirected graph, right? So we sort of would like to check all the immediate neighbors and see if any of them are the solution. And if we were really lucky, if the puzzle was almost solved, maybe one of those would be the immediate solution. And if not, then we're gonna take one of those length one states and expand all its neighbors, right? This one and this one off the screen and this one, and try to see if any of those uh, our our solution and then so this is all the thing this is the thing of link zero we should probably start to make sure it's not already solved then we'll examine all the things at distance one by putting them in a queue like you do with bread first search and see if any of them are there and if not we'll dequeue one of the length one things and put all its neighbors in this one and this one and this one and then see if any of those are the solution. Oh, and by the way, you know, I probably, it's gonna be hard to avoid queuing this one also, right? Because the sort of standard breadth first algorithm is to pick out a thing, add all its neighbors to the queue, and then mark it closed maybe. So maybe we need to keep track of which states we've already seen and when we add states here, we won't add neighbors we've already checked out, right? Because there's no way that this sequence of moves is gonna be part of the shortest solution. So the cool advantage of this, the cool thing with breadth first search is that we are guaranteed to examine states in order of distance from the origin, which sounds pretty good and that means that if there is a short solution, and we know from solving these as humans that there are pretty short solutions, right? We'd be surprised if it takes more on a 15 puzzle more than, I don't know, 15 squared moves, let's say, 225 moves to solve this. And so maybe we can just expand outward from the starting position and the nice thing about breadth first search is when I do hit a goal position, it's the path from the start to the goal is guaranteed to be a shortest path. And so that's kind of cool. But 
we've talked about both speed and memory, and it seems like there's potential speed and memory issues here. Uh, I have to keep track of where I've been, partly because the queue contains all the places that I've been that aren't closed yet, but even after I've closed a state, even after I've closed this state, I have to remember it so that I don't ever try to go back there. So I'm gonna need a queue of states that are the frontier, are the nodes that are being considered as candidate solutions, and I'm gonna need a stop list, a, a set of states that I've already visited and don't ever wanna go back to. You know, if I really look at 120 moves, there's a lot of places I can get in 120 moves, even taking into account that I don't go backwards. So it's not super clear how efficient this is gonna be, but that's the general idea here is, and this is sort of the simplest thing I think that is has any chance of being better than just shuffling things around randomly. So it's probably a good starting place. And like I say, this shortest solutions properly sounds pre property sounds pretty neat. So I'm kind of excited about that. That sounds cool. Um, so the bad news, of course, is that, wait, that's wrong. Okay, so the bad news is that my slides are wrong and I'll edit them later. The good news is that this is a complete search method. Uh, if, if we don't use a stop list, there's no guarantee of termination, but that's okay. Uh, because we're gonna, right? Otherwise, you know, we, we could keep queuing states forever. And so, you know, we could start by going here and then back here and adding this into the queue. And then we'll end up going back here and adding this into the queue. We don't want to do that, right? And so if we're you know, and we won't come back here until we've exhausted all the distance one states. So eventually, if there is a solution, this will find it. But if there isn't a solution, we'll just keep in queuing longer and longer attempts forever. So maybe adding a stop list so that when a state's no good, it's removed from consideration. If I do that, then eventually I will have searched all the states in my 15 puzzle. Now, like we said, a 15 puzzle has a lot of states, so that could take an exceptionally long time in case that the start state, the goal state is not reachable. If somebody swaps the tiles, like we've talked about, swaps two adjacent tiles, then this puzzle's not solvable anymore, and this thing will run out the whole state space before it can't find any neighbors that aren't already in the stop list. And in that situation, it will terminate saying no solution. But so this is what's called, so, Breadth first search with a stop list is what's called a complete method in the sense that it will either find a shortest solution if a solution exists or it will fail to find a solution in a finite amount of time, not a short amount of time, and will stop. And that'll be the thing that it does. So unlike our random thing where we can just shuffle around forever if there's no solution and where even if there is a solution we can shuffle around for an awful long time before we find it, we expect this to be terminate faster and produce better results. So uh, if you uh, implement that then and I'm not going to show you the implementation right this second but our code base that we're using for this class is contains uh, an implementation. If I look at my slider.py implementation, uh, I notice that one of the solvers that I can use is the bread for search solver. And so I'm gonna try that out on some random puzzles and see how it does. Let's start with a small number, 100 puzzles. And let's try a, uh, no, sorry, minus N3. Sorry, I'm gonna start with, a th I'm gonna start with three puzzles is what I'm gonna do. And I'm going to use the solver 
that's the bread first search solver and let's see how fast it goes uh this doesn't look so great but there it goes eventually after some number of seconds it returns an answer and the answer is much much shorter right if i try that with solver equals random and you know it'll, be, it'll pin well i probably prefer the 26 move solution that this program finds to the 112,000 move solution that randomly walking around does right taboo's better how fast is, how many how long are the solutions produced by taboo oh in this case they were more right notice how much variance there is here there's a lot of luck for the um red for search solver all the solutions are going to be kind of the same length kind of the same amount of time right 21 moves 20 moves notice that the 20 move solution the 19 move solution we just got really unlucky the first time that happens a lot faster, right, than the 26 move solution we started with. Why is that? Well, because the number of states explored by the breadth first solution, you know, solution, right, is exponential in the in the length of the shortest solution. And so if the shortest solution is you know, and the the base to that exponent is probably something like 3 like we've discussed before, so the the difference between a, a 19 move solution and a 26 move solution is three to the seventh three to the seventh is you know so it's going to take 2,000 times longer to find the one than the other so it's really unfortunate that we started out with a with a tough puzzle here's another tough puzzle apparently this one looks like it'll be about you know it might be a length 26 again or so yep so this is an improvement the runtime is actually a little longer than the taboo search runtime but it produces a useful result and I can modify this program if I want to a little bit and actually produce the sequence of moves that would do this and so now I actually have a tool that's useful for solving three puzzles. This is a smarter tool in some sense because the answers it gives out are answers that a human being could reasonably execute. So what happens when n is four? Well, as you might suspect, there again, those solutions are pretty dramatically longer because we have that much more tiles to move around and I don't expect this to finish anytime soon. I don't even think I'm gonna let it run out. But there we have it. We have breadth first search, which is a reasonable way to solve sliding tile puzzles. And really it's a reasonable way to solve any of these kind of state space search problems, except that the memory requirements and the time requirements are very large. At some point I'm gonna I'm gonna stop this because at some point it's gonna actually run out of memory. Notice what it's doing when it stops. It's doing a deep copy. So it's adding to the stop list. So it's making yet another copy of the state. The stop list gets very large, very fast. Maybe we should instrument this a little and print the size of the stop list. Now nah, we'll do it in class later. But the stop list is very large. By the time you're done, the queue is very large of breadth for search states. And the runtime is pretty long. So, well, that's a technique for these puzzles. It's probably, we hope we could do better. And the first thing we'd like to do is sort of explore whether we really need the spread for search queue or whether there's something else we could do. Another approach that we might consider is depth for search. And the nice thing about depth for search, right, is that I don't have this big queue of states like breadth first search does I just have a you know a, a stack of states and the stack is proportional to the length not to the number of states outstanding and so it's a much much smaller data structure I I probably the problem with that of course is that if I start depth first searching this well I take off in this direction and keep going out in this direction you know off the page one way or another and uh, 
there again, if I don't have a stop list, this is going to loop, right? Eventually, I'll get somewhere, I'll get, I'll go somewhere to some neighbor, you know, it might be immediately I go to some neighbor that I've already been at, and so again, I can have infinitely long paths, but here, even if there is a solution, I may not find it, because I may be exploring some other infinitely long path first. There's sort of some element of randomness in the in this one, especially in the order in which you search states and you can get lucky or less lucky, but the whole thing seems terrible. So again, the solution is to use a stop list. And I run out toward the end of the thing. But when I find a state that doesn't have any unexplored neighbors, then I backtrack, right? Like depth first search does back to the last state that had explored unexplored neighbors and start trying from there. Really, you expect the performance of this depth first search to uh, not be better. And I think if we look at that, uh, I assume it's just DFS. Um, Yeah, DFS. So let's try an n equals three depth first search solution. Oh, that's interesting. What we find is that there's a bug. Okay. That's interesting. Uh, all right, I'm gonna stop for a bit and fix this bug and then go on. And we're back. Sorry about that little break there. A five hour all night debugging session later. My code is in much better shape. Welcome to the world of artificial intelligence. I will talk in class about how I debugged and what I debugged. The bottom line is that my depth first search and related things were a little bit buggy. So let's just pick up where we left off and keep going and see how this runs now. So I'm gonna go ahead and run slider again. Oh. I think minus S actually works. Whoops. And we're running a depth first search on an n equals three puzzle, and look at that, 48,000 states. Just as a reminder, if I use breadth first search, I tend to get much, much better numbers, so that isn't so great. But on the other hand, it's better than random, and obviously these aren't on the same puzzle. One comparability thing you can do is use the same puzzle. That's an option for us. So let's try that. Whoops. So this is random search on this particular puzzle. This one's a harder one than some of the other ones we've looked at. So 2.25 million states. Here's BFS on this puzzle, which will take a bit. It's not super fast. So let's get some performance on this. 24, so it's a length 24 solution. And here's our depth research solution, which is somewhere in the middle in terms of how long it takes to run. So we'll let that run out. And it depth researched 107,000 states. How could it search so many states? Well, because it's essentially doing what the random solver does, except that it's being more careful about not ever going back. So because it's searching complete instead of randomly, it will stop eventually if there's no solution and it will not walk through a bunch of previously visited states, but still it's basically just random search at that point. Now an obvious thing to do there is to add a heuristic to guide the search to make it aim at a solution a little better. That's not what we're gonna do right now. We'll talk about that next lecture. What we're gonna do this time is we're going to 
go on and talk about the next thing that we'd like to talk about, which is, well, so the big advantage of depth first search is that it should be able to be faster. And it should be able to be faster because it doesn't have to keep a big queue of open states and process that queue. And so there's some hope that you can make it run in a lot less space. Now for an undirected graph like this, it still has to keep a stop list, but the stop list doesn't have to be a list of whole states. It can be a list of hashes and that's what we did. So that'll be a little smaller. The big problem is what we saw, right? There's no reason that the solution produced by depth first search should be 107,000 in length. We really want a shorter solution. And to get that, we're gonna use a trick that's a really nice little trick that's used a lot in both one single agent search and in, later in adversary search when we talk about that, called depth first at iterative deepening. So here's the deal. Imagine that instead of searching the whole search space, instead of going just you know off in some random direction out to infinity, what if we just looked at the four neighbors, right? Well, if one of those four neighbors happens to be the solution, then we've found a solution. But remember, it's a complete search. If it searches all four neighbors and doesn't find a solution, it answers, nope, haven't found a solution yet. So if we limit the depth to one, we say, look, it, once you've got out to depth one, you just don't search anymore. Then we can look at the immediate neighborhood and know that there's no length one solution. Well, then maybe we should look for length two solutions. So I start the search clear over, and this time I allow myself to go two steps out. And if I get more than two steps away ever uh, from the start, then I'm like, no, we're not gonna look there. And one of two things will happen. I'll find a solution two steps away, or I won't. And if I don't, we know there's no length two solution, no depth two solutions, right? I can keep going like that, right? I can search depth one, then depth two, then depth three, and by the time I get, you know, at some point, one of two things will happen. I'll find a solution, in which case I am guaranteed that that is a shortest solution because we know there's no shorter one and we know it's only that long. And if I don't find, you know, other, don't find a solution, eventually I can say, well, I've searched everything and I can keep track of that. I can keep track whether I stopped early. And if I ever go deep enough that I never stop early, then it's complete search. I don't, there's no solution. So this is depth first iterative deepening and it has an obvious drawback. And that obvious drawback is it keeps starting over, right? Every time it searches a depth, it searches all the previous depths, essentially. So when I'm searching at depth four, I redo all the search that was done at depth three, all the search that was done at depth two, all the search that was done at depth one. Doesn't seem all that neat, but the interesting thing, right? If you think about how the search space looks, the number of states new states you search grows exponentially, right? All the new states you search at depth four are the ones that are exactly of depth four. Well, there's a lot more of those, right? Than the st states up to three. In fact, we sort of know that even for a small branching factor like this game has, right? Most of the states that you search in any given depth are gonna be new states. And so it isn't as inefficient as it seems. So, we have to redo, but the redoing really isn't that expensive. It's a thing that um, we're maybe willing to pay. So let's see um, what depth first iterative deepening does with our test puzzle. And again, this is a long puzzle, so the depth's gonna get good. Notice how it just whizzed through the first few depths because there aren't that many nodes at distance seven or eight or nine or 10. And notice that as we start to go deeper, it slows down. We get deeper and deeper, uh, search that takes longer and longer, but it's still going in a reasonable amount of time. And now we've searched to depth 23, and obviously if the solution is too far away, this is gonna start getting really bad, but it hasn't yet. And I think, if I remember right, that maybe depth 24 is where we'll find our answer for this problem. Uh, so let's, yep, 
There it is. It found a solution of length 24. Well, is that optimal? Well, let's compare. What does breadth first search say the optimal solution length is? Breadth first search says the optimal solution length is 24. Hey, they agree. So that gives us some confidence that after a whole bunch of epic bug fixing that depth first iterative deepening is actually finding shortest solutions. And it should, it's, you know, the way the algorithm works, it's sort of supposed to find shortest solutions. So that's a really good trick. And we'll talk about that trick and some of its potential drawbacks next lecture, but it's a pretty common trick to use in solving these kinds of puzzles. Now, this depth first iterative deepening used a stop list. And there again, the stop list is expensive because it takes memory and memory is slow to access. I didn't have to use a stop list because if I don't use a stop list, what happens? Well, I'll revisit states a whole bunch, but not that much because I'll never search a path longer than the depth. And so it'll cut itself off. It just means I'll go in circles a lot, but I won't go in circles that much because I'm limited in the depth I can go. And so sometimes that's a trade-off you wanna make. You wanna decide that rather than keeping a stop list around, you wanna just search. By the way, this, de this implementation of depth first iterative deepening is actually much slower than it needs to be. I know a trick for making it faster, but I just don't have the energy to program it right now. And that's to, uh, not use a bunch of space for the for new states and instead just keep a stack of moves and there's a trick there but eh, it was didn't seem worth the trouble this is the idea so that's sort of if you don't know anything about what a solution looks like that's sort of as good as you can do you sort of can go poking around in the search space maybe in an organized way maybe in a random way trying to figure out where your goal state is. And if you get to the goal state, great. And if you remember how you got there, you've got a path from the start to the goal. But you'll notice that it scales really, really badly. Just like all our other solutions, if I use, uh, uh, try to try solve a 15 puzzle this way in Python, terribly slow language, but really in general, right? Um, It, wait a minute, not in 15, sorry. I was like, wow, no, we won't be solving any uh, 15 squared minus is 225 minus one, 224 puzzles, that won't be a thing. Let's try again with four. There, that makes more sense. <laughs> uh, you know, this isn't gonna finish with breadth first search. It isn't gonna finish with random search. It won't finish with depth first iterative deepening. We'll just keep going and going. And as you notice, the, the iterations were getting slower and slower. And also the branching factor is higher. So we search more states per iteration. It's already slowing down when we, by the time we get to 15 or so. Not a productive way. So we're gonna to have to do something more clever if we wanna tackle these puzzles of reasonable sizes, right? Humans solve these things very fast. And that's the topic of the next lecture, is how we do heuristic search instead to try to get things to solve faster. So that's that. I hope that was useful. Thanks very much, as always, for listening. Please stay safe and well out there. And I look forward to talking to you again soon.